I'm Nuzlocking every mainline Pokemon game in chronological order, again. After the task of taking down each game without a single repeat Pokemon, I asked, how can I up the ante? And the answer was obvious, shiny Pokemon only. That's right, 40 games, no repeats, all shinies. Can I pull it off? Well, let's see if I can keep it going with the last game of Generation 2, Pokemon Crystal. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and click the bell to get notified for every time I upload. Like the video if you're excited for Season 2 of the Franchise Nuzlocke, and comment down below telling me how absolutely insane I am for deciding to do this again. Rules are in the description, and if you want to see me continue this series, I'll be streaming this entire challenge right here on YouTube. So if you want to help increase the timer for the series, as it's pretty hard to dedicate time to it without losing out on time to make other videos, hence why I haven't streamed in a little bit, definitely make sure to stop in and maybe toss a coin to your streamer. But with that, let's begin. So, Pokemon Crystal is immediately started here with four copies of the game, making it much faster to soft reset for the last remaining starter for Johto, Cyndaquil. I wanted to hold off on this one since it's probably the most useful for a Nuzlocke, with Totodile being better for speedrunning, and at least it gives a different variety compared to the first season of this series. Now, because the inputs are supposed to be synchronized, I tried naming my trainer and it just didn't work because some of them fell off the synchronization, so I hit the start button with no name to go back and reset the cursor positioning, but apparently it always defaults to Chris. By the way of Pokemon Crystal, I'm now deemed Chris P. Meatball. That's a nice ring to it. But of course, we need to get into those soft resets. Now, Chikorita took a little over 1,100 resets, Totodile took over 13,000, so I'm hoping Cyndaquil takes somewhere in the middle to average out to the 8,192 shiny odds. However, it just so happened to get a little lucky. Equivalent of a Professor Oak's challenge in the Battle Network series to be, get as many battle chips as possible before each boss? Probably, yeah. I would say so. That was fast. Holy hot goddamn flippity floppity on a stick. That looks really good. Yep, 3,300 encounters on the dot. Well, 3,304 if I had counted the ones on screen, but that's still less than half odds, and I already have my shiny purple boy for the team. I really love the shiny coloration of this Cyndaquil line in Gen 2. The purple stands out beautifully compared to what the really dull brown tan it is in Gen 3 and onward. So no wonder they brought back this coloration for Hisui and Typhlosion, slapped a ring of destruction on its neck, and called it a day. It's literally perfect. But before we continue, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Ding Dong Dang. Ding Dong Dang is an online mobile casual game that combines massively multiplayer online features with both casual and competitive gameplay elements. The star of the show is none other than Crayon Shinchan, and let me tell you, his island is packed with unique activities like fishing and playing football. Now you might be asking, what makes Ding Dong Dang stand out? Well, first off, it's incredibly fun and social. You can join up with up to four friends and explore three different islands, including Shinchan's Island, where surprises and new adventures await at every turn. The game is designed to foster both group and solo play, so whether you're a social butterfly or a lone explorer, there's something for you. The variety of gameplay is another big highlight. From racing to puzzle games, survival challenges to treasure hunting, there's always something exciting to keep you entertained. Plus, the easy entry barriers make it perfect for all types of players. Whether you're a casual gamer or someone who loves a good competitive challenge, you'll find your niche here. Ready to dive into the fun and start your adventure with Shin-chan? Well, what are you waiting for, as Ding Dong Dang is available for free on iPhone, Android, and Steam. Check it out using my link below and join the excitement by gathering your friends, exploring the islands, conquering the mini-games, and unlocking amazing rewards. Don't miss out, the world of Ding Dong Dang awaits. But now, let's get back to the challenge. From here, I don't have to fight anything until the rival battle. Taking it out with a myriad of tackles and a held berry for the HP advantage, considering Scratch has five more base power compared to tackle, winning me the fight and letting me name the rival Poo Six. Of course, it's, you know, the sixth game in the series. You get the point. Anyway, I jump over to Route 46 in the morning straight after for our first encounter, Fan P. Uh, yeah, uh, 5% encounter. Now, I figured it would be a little bit of a genius move to allow for a Lewis script to be able to hunt for this shiny, considering I've been on a little bit of a burnout streak as of late, and I've been meaning to play a bunch of other games lately. I mean, when your backlog has over a thousand titles on it, you're bound to look at that and say, wow, I should really play Romancing Saga at some point, only to boot up Mega Man 4 for the 15th time. However, I actually decided to boot up Mega Man The Sequel Wars during this. This is a fan-made remake of Mega Man 4 for the Sega Genesis using the graphics of the Wily Wars, but not being a ROM hack, it's straight built from the ground up from scratch, 
only using the sprite from Mega Man from Wily Wars and creating everything else as a new version. The environments, the music, even the options of being able to play as Roll or Proto Man are actually fantastic. The team recently dropped a teaser trailer for their Mega Man 5 remake, so if you're interested in trying them out, look up Mega Man The Sequel Wars on Twitter as their free downloads, and not piracy since they're not ROM hacks, just fan games. But I'm getting off track. As for Fan P, this was a pretty big risk here, considering sure, I have dupes claws of Rattata and Geodude. Uh, but for not for Spiro, uh, definitely not for Spiro. However, my first phase was a Geodude, but considering the game was running at a ludicrous speed, the phase happened after 28,479 encounters, letting me almost beat Mega Man 4 during that time. God, I had some really bad streaks like with Hopip, but Geodude was even worse. I'm glad I decided to play something else during that time because I probably would have driven myself crazy. However, with Spiro available on Route 33 following Union Cave, I'm gonna hold off on grabbing Fan P here so that I can grab Spiro there as Dupes Claws, not use it since I'm planning on saving it for either Fire Red or Leaf Green, then Fan P is able to be gotten before Bugsy. That was terrible grammar, but go with it. Sure, this leaves me with one less encounter going to Faulkner, but I've got more where that came from. With the next encounter being in Dark Cave, and considering I've got dupes of Geodude and Zubat, I'm sure you're already knowing what's coming. It's not Teddy Ursa, sadly, but Dunsparce is a 1% encounter from this area, and I'm really gonna need it for the higher than normal stats at this point in the game due to being a single stage mon as of Gen 2, and for the stab normal moves like Rage. The first phase only took 1,083 encounters, good thing after that nonsense on Route 46 being yet another Geodude. Sure, I guess I'll take a full odds Geodude. Could be a good wonder trade bait or whatever they call it in Scarlet and Violet. Phase 2 is after 4,705 encounters with another Geodude. Uh, please stop giving me this. This really is a nasty colored rock. At least in the newer games, it's like a gold coloration and looks valuable. These just look like goddamn kidney stones. The next phase is only after 460 encounters, and it's... What's behind door number 3? It's f***ing Geodude. I am going to lose it. I already have the whole evolution line in shiny form, so at least give me, like, some more Zubats for that living deck spot. Also, dang, 460 encounters, that's actually really quick. But following only three phases, and admittedly after another 30,373 encounters, Shiny Dunsparce appeared. Yeah, four Shinies in here, no Zubats, but we managed to find Dunsparce first. Once again, I'm glad I had the Lua script here, since if it took that long for me to find this in real life, it would have drained the 100 plus hours on the timer, and I don't think people would be very happy about that. But with Dunsparce in hand, that's all I need for Faulkner, giving it a berry and rage spamming through Pidgey, using three against it, and two against Pidgeotto, following the two gusts to clear out the team and win me the fight. I had a feeling I'd need it, plus if the first round of the franchise Nuzlocke was anything to go by, Dunsparce is no slouch in Gen 2. Moving on through Route 32 and into Union Cave, I'm finally able to get down to Route 33 for the search for Spiro. Again, I'm not planning on using it, I just need this dupes clause for Route 46 to therefore get Fan P guaranteed. There's no other Pokemon on this round that I haven't used before, so I'm clear to just hunt to my heart's content during the playtime. During this though, instead of playing another franchise, I started my Professor Oak's challenge of Pokemon Legends Arceus, as I plan on perfecting each dex entry for that challenge since, after all, you need to finish the Pokedex as much as possible before each gym, or in this case, every noble Pokemon. And that goes for every single possible task in Legends Arceus, which is a ludicrous undertaking, but I can't wait to stream more of it as well. During this time, though, we not only phased once with Rattata after 8,295 encounters, not twice with another Rattata after 2,584 encounters, not thrice with yet another Geodude at 3,730 encounters, which I ran away from by accident, which yes, you can do in Crystal, as it's not compatible with the original Game Boy. I don't remember if I mentioned it in the Gold or Silver videos, but if you run into a Shiny in those games, you can't run away since the developers accounted for the monocolor screens of the original model in case you didn't catch the Shiny Sparkles. Great touch by them, honestly. Back to phasing, phase 4 was another Geodude after 4,493 encounters, which was perfect since I was trying to complete the Capture Pichu while sleeping task, letting me wait around in Legends Arceus while attempting to capture it at the same time. Phase 5 was Hopip, one I needed for the living decks after 14,553 encounters because I'm not allowed to have one of these unless it's over odds. Phase 6 was another Hopip, finally redeeming itself after only 6,840 encounters, completing my set for the shiny living decks. 
Phase 7 was yet another shiny Geodude. I'm gonna go insane because of these rocks. But 1,579 encounters between phases isn't bad and continues to be below odds. Phase 8 was another goddamn Geodude after 1944 encounters. Listen, I appreciate the insane, repeated below odds encounters here, but I don't need any more kidney stones. Lord knows my consumption of diet soda as a kid is probably gonna make those a reality anyway, and I don't need to be reminded of them. Phase 9 ended up being, you guessed it, a shiny Geodude after 16,071 encounters. I guess the game figured out I was complaining and wanted to both rub nearly double odds and another rock in my face. But finally, finally, on the 10th shiny encounter of Route 33, Spiro appeared on encounter 8,340, getting it after a grand total of 68,429 encounters. We were 91 away. 91 away from 69,420. That would have been really goddamn funny. Uh, but I do want to put that into perspective. It took that many encounters in 10 phases for a 30% encounter for Spiro, whereas it took 4 phases and 36,621 encounters for Dunsparce and Dark Cave, which was a 1% encounter. Sometimes I question why my luck is so terrible with ranges, but now I'm starting to realize that trying to get Gaumon encounters as shinies is my second kryptonite in the Pokemon series. But hey, at least that means we get to go back to Route 46 for the actual grind, as opposed to the preliminary grind that we just did. But oh my god, it's the return! It's the shiny Geodude! I was just starting to feel withdrawal symptoms without having any more of those. God, I'm only on game 6 and I'm already getting driven insane. Anyway, phase 1 here ended after 14,393 encounters, so this one's likely gonna be a long ride. Phase 2 was another Spiro at 11,184 encounters, which is bound to happen, so I'm glad I got the dupes clause rather than accidentally encountering this earlier. But insanely enough, after getting off of stream and hopping into a Discord call with my buddies Caleb.exe and Sunny from the Top Cut Podcast, both wonderful Yu-Gi-Oh! and Elestrals creators, in case you were curious, I decided to head off to bed and told them to shout at me if a shiny popped up. Especially if it was fan pee. Turns out, half an hour after I went to bed and accidentally fell asleep, they started going crazy since I was streaming the game to them in Discord and after 40,734 encounters, Shiny Fanpy finally appeared. Once again, after only four phases total here if I'm including the first one, but wow, what a freaking insane amount of encounters between those last two. That absolutely is now in first place for most encounters or resets for any of the shinies that I've gotten so far in this series, dethroning shiny Pinsir from blue by nearly 5,000 encounters. I made sure to grab it in the morning, and thankfully it didn't run away, giving me a wonderfully pale shiny that I'll be more than happy to add to the team. Honestly, I expected the time needed to get both Dunsparce and Fanpy with the Lewis script to still take me a week at the very least, but the fact that both appeared so quickly really cut down on time, letting me move on to my fourth encounter. I decided to use Ghastly here because, wow, the elemental punches are very broken when they're special, and especially when Ghastly's evolutions get all three of them! So I headed into Sprout Tower at night, and after only 539 encounters, the blue gas ball appeared. That's for you. Well, fuck me, I guess. 539 encounters? Deserved after the last fucking phase. I guess my ridiculous luck with super long phases, followed by an incredibly short phase, continues. And I'm very much appreciative of it not being the 15% Rattata here. I think I would have driven myself nuts. I nicknamed it Baby, as all of my shiny encounters are nicknamed by you, the viewers. I made it an incentive during my Donothon for this series that if you gift 5 memberships to the channel or did a $25 super chat, you'd get to nickname a Pokemon line of your choice. So if there's a Pokemon you really want for this series, make sure to pop into the stream, check out the nickname spreadsheet, which I'll link in the description of this video, and claim it for yourself. You know what's insane? At this point in the run, my in-game timer is already at 947 hours and 3 minutes. If you already commented being like, man, this isn't cool that you're using scripts to find these shinies, this is legit, then I hope that amount of time gives you some goddamn perspective. I would not want to waste 947 hours worth of time for a single video, let alone the viewer's time and money that they'd be using to contribute to the timer. But hey, if the rest of my encounters go well, maybe I can beat Crystal before hitting the 999 hours and 59 minutes cap set by the game. With all that said, after training up to level 12 on level 2 Pidgeys from Route 29 since yes, we're doing stat experience again, and of course I'm optimizing it to the best of my ability, it's time to finally head into Azalea Town and take on the rocket takeover of the Slowpoke well, ending with Wannabe Proton. He's got a single coughing. It goes down quickly, so who cares? 
Uh, maybe he wouldn't have been such a wannabe if he decided to pick up some gamer subs using my affiliate link and code chaoticmeat at checkout for 10% off. You don't want to be a wannabe, right? So I'd highly suggest going down and picking some up for yourself. I've been drinking this stuff for years, and it's a wonderful substitute for sodas, being sugar-free and very low-calorie, while also having caffeinated and non-caffeinated varieties. My favorite flavors lately have been the Pineapple Cocktail, Titty Milk, and Guacamole Gamer Fart 9000. And yes, the names are absolutely absurd. They taste fantastic, and all flavors have a sort of profile on them, so you know what you're getting into before you make your purchase on something like... Good. Yes, there's a flavor that's just named good. Also, if you pick up any of these beverage mixes, you can add time to the Donothon timer. One minute for every $2.50 spent. Just make sure to let me know you made a purchase while I'm live with this series. Anyway, enough terrible segues into shilling. Let's take out Bugsy. He leads with Metapod, so I go with Dunsparce and go straight for Rage Strats, hoping for enough tackles and poison stings from it and Kakuna respectively to make Scyther a cinch, and sure enough, it's more than enough. Taking out Metapod in three shots, Kakuna in two following a missed range, because of course we did, and Scyther in two hits to win the fight single-handedly. Straight after is our rival fight, so I lead Fanpy against his Ghastly to take it out with two mud slaps. Gotta thank the lack of Levitate for that one. Next out is Croconaw, so I swap into Dunsparce to start the Rage Train, hitting once and getting hit with Rage in return, twice in the face of Water Gun, finally KOing with the third, as his last Pokemon in Zubat is thrown to the field, being obliterated in one shot thanks to the powered-up Rage to win me the fight. Perfect, now I just gotta make my way through Ilex Forest and Route 34 to make it to Goldenrod City. I've got another encounter here, actually, in Wobbuffet from the Game Corner. Now, I know that sounds absurd, but this is the easiest place to get it, and it'd still be decently useful. Uh, sure, I could RNG manipulate a shiny Why Not Egg in any of the Hoenn games, but I think it'll be more useful here as an extremely solid wall that can hit back with a ridiculous amount of damage with Counter or Mirror Coat. That and someone bribed me with $500 to do it. That's another incentive for the Donothon, by the way. If you really want me to use a Pokemon in the series, and you want the nickname for it as well, you can do the same, but I made sure to set it incredibly high just to not derail the flow of these streams. But considering the fact that this has already happened four times for Entei, Wobbuffet, and two more encounters in future games, as well as two more in this game, I'm guessing people really love making me sit through torture. Getting back to Wobbuffet, after using my save file with four copies of the game, I'm actually able to hunt this absurdly fast. Since Wobbuffet only costs 1500 coins, I'm able to get 7500 and clear out my party except for one Pokemon, letting me get 20 encounters per reset. While this is fast, this is still one I have to do manually and it takes quite a few hours, taking almost an entire day in 6653 encounters before the shiny purple punching bag shows up, and boy that one looks really nice. What can I say? I'm just a fan of purple. With five members on the team, though, I'm more than confident going into Whitney's gym, especially when I can use counter on Miltank to take that thing down easily, especially if it starts getting into a rollout chain. Clefairy, eh, not so much, considering Double Slap can only be countered on the final hit, so I waste quite a bit of time trying to do so, all while Metronome lands on spite of all things to lower my power points, forcing me out into Dunsparce after 11 of the 20 power points have been drained to KO with a stab return, leading to Miltank. Rollout is being set up with two hits as I go for Claire to paralyze to end the streak after hitting a single return, but that's more than enough HP for Wobbuffet to come back in, counter its stomp, and KO the stupid cow into oblivion, winning me the fight deathless, which is very much not a guarantee if the gold run was anything to go by. Before heading out, I made sure to grab the TM for Thunder for Ghastly, since we still don't have access to Thunder Punch or the other two, and I figured why not. It'll at least be useful 70% of the time, and that's more than it has been since getting it. Routes 35, 36, and 37 don't provide any trouble, letting me get up into Ecritique City to challenge Morty. But of course, in Crystal, the rival fight is required since I absolutely need to let the legendary beasts roam from the Burned Tower. He leads off with Haunter, I go with Dunsparce, but thanks to the TM for Dig being available from the National Park, that's an easy one-shot following a curse that does a quarter damage, though it doesn't do anything on turns where I KO the opposing Pokémon, letting me swap out Scott Free as he sends in Magnemite, going into Quilava to tank a Sonic Boom, and fire back with a super effective Ember to one-shot it as well. Third out is Croconaw, so it's out to Wobbuffet, and considering both Water and Dark are special types here, it makes more sense to go for Miracle, taking it out in two shots as Zubat enters last. It's able to confuse Wobbuffet and basically render it useless with how little HP it has by this point, so I swap into Dunspar, scaling with a single stab 102 power return to win the fight. Once again, I can't complain, when the Pooh Man has a Pooh team, it just ends up being that easy. 
After taking out Morty's required trainers though, I'm able to train up to level 25, giving me access to both Gengar and Dawnfan for the rest of the run. And you know what that means? Obliteratingly powerful elemental punches, and a pretty damn good ground type. Albeit for the latter of those, I'm still waiting for Earthquake, which won't be until the Elite Four. At least Mudslap is stab, and has accuracy deprivation, so it at least does something. Anyway, Morty leads off with Ghastly, I'm leading Dunsparce, and with all of the stat experience at my disposal, I'm able to outspeed with Dig, dodging any chance of Curse as it gets the KO, leading to Haunter. Once again, Dunsparce outspeeds for Dig, dodging Hypnosis to KO, and somehow outspeed Gengar in order to KO it after two shots, doing the same to Haunter number two to KO for the fourth time and win me the Fog Badge. Like I said, Dunsparce is no slouch, and stat experience makes it quite broken once you start getting major investments in attack and speed. Now before I head off to Batch 5, I just wanted to show off a little friend in the party. Yep, that's Shiny Raikou, and you want to know how I got it? Reverse engineered events from the Pokemon Center New York that were distributed back in 2000. Instead of having to shiny hunt for this thing manually, instead I'm able to have this sent into the game, giving me the ability to use it once the level cap hits 40 for Claire. And before you type that comment, at least it's better than having a script that had to use save states in order to hunt for Entei. The next three gyms are pretty trivial to take down, considering I have more than enough of flexibility in my level cap to take out the required trainers in areas like the Lighthouse, Route 43, the Shiny Gyarados fight in the Lake of Rage, the Mahogany Rocket hideout, oh, and, uh, hi, native Raikou, I was not expecting to see one of these without a repel on, I just accidentally ran into it. Kinda funny considering we just got the event one, but hey, there's at least a comparison of the yellow versus the nice orange coloration of the shiny. Getting back to the required trainers, all I need to take down are Yusin and Sianwood, which is soloed by Dunsparce in case you thought that was enough of a major fight for me to talk about, as well as the gym trainers from both Sianwood City and Mahogany Town, letting me finally go after the gym leaders in level cap order. First up, Chuck is rocking Primeape as his lead, and considering Gengar is immune to all of his attacks, and everything but Surf from Polyrath, I'm more than capable of ripping through with all three elemental punches once each on Primeape while he's stuck using Leer, KOing and leading to Polyrath, who falls to two Thunder Punches, hilariously with the first one getting the paralysis and holding him down for the turn. Winning me the fight? Totally damageless. Second up, Price leads Seal as I once again lead with Gengar, using Thunder Punch against it for the one shot, then two on Dugong following an Aurora Beam for minimal damage, leaving just Pilus Wine to go down to two Fire Punches as he just uses Mist. Huh, uh, not sure why that was the choice, but I'll take it. I mean, there weren't any ground-type moves on the set, so there wasn't anything to worry about, but Icy Wind and Blizzard surely would have been better options, but I digress. Last up is Jasmine in Olivine City, getting pummeled thanks to Don Fan's Mud Slap, one-shotting both Magnemites after outspeeding and leaving just Steelix. I'm kinda just clicking buttons here, just using all of my Mud Slap power points despite Steelix having a massive defense stat, but considering this basically makes Iron Tail useless as it already sits as a 75% accuracy rating, minus 6 accuracy is really making it completely useless, only connecting with one and letting me finally snuff it out with return following a Hyper Potion to earn me the Mineral Badge. Perfect. Seven down, one to go, and of course, the rocket hideout. Do I even need to say anything about the rocket hideout? Well, at least I get to bring Raikou into the team with the level cap being 40, but I'm not going to be using it for the time being as it's technically a traded Pokemon, and that extra EXP can mean the difference between losing it all for Claire or just tossing it out and tearing straight through Kingdra. Regardless, we do have a rival fight here, so I may as well go over it. He leads Golbat, I lead Typhlosion, since I did get access to Thunder Punch on Evolution, though I'm very stupid and didn't teach that beforehand. Instead, using a combo of Flame Wheel and Return through Confuse Ray to KO without taking any damage, leading to Feraligator. Out to Dunsparce we go as Water Gun does around 15%, letting me connect with a critical return to one shot once again. Then Magnemite and Haunter come out in sequence and both go down to dig once each, and Sneasel goes down to return, giving me the quick win before beating up the executives for wasting everyone's time. Again, why does Wannabe Archer have a Houndour and a Coughing in the final rocket battle? I'm just so damn tired of Johto. Please get me out of here and let me get to the great regions of Gens 3 through 5. I just want to play Hoenn. I just want to play Sinnoh. I just want to play Unova, and those are the only three I care about. Except for Scarlet and Violet. I still think that Scarlet and Violet are great games, only on emulation. Don't play that crap on the actual console because it does not work. I have tried it for the first time. I tried Scarlet and Violet on the actual Switch console for the first time just to see how bad the performance was. And oh my god, I... I'm appalled. I, straight up, I finally have the perspective of how people actually normally play this game, but... 
it's uh, I, I I just don't have any words. It's absolutely abysmal in terms of its speed, the slowdown, the dropped frame rates. It just doesn't work. You really do need an emulator and a decent PC that's able to upscale it and not go down in frame rate. Heck, I usually play it at a two times speed because I normally think Pokemon games are very slow. But I digress. I'm just very spoiled when it comes to this stuff. One ice path later, and I'm in Blackthorn City, getting everyone to level 40 after taking out Claire's trainers. But there is one more thing before fighting Claire. Fun fact, because the DVs decide both the shininess and hidden power typings for each Pokemon in Gen 2, the only typings shinies can have are either Grass or Dragon. Thankfully, I got HP Dragon at 69 power on Gengar, replacing Fire Punch because, oh, the elemental punches are all infinitely obtainable TMs, so I have all three when I can just have the two most optimal for each fight. Anyway, Claire leads off with Dragonair, having a grand total of three of them that are all one-shot by Ice Punch, leaving just Kingdra to be two-shot by Hidden Power following a critical surf that did over half, but not so much to where I was remotely worried. Sorry, Johto League, you are no match for Gengar. Now before I go into the League, I do need to do the main story quest for Suicune, and... Eh, why not? We already got the other two Johto Beasts as Shinies, at least this one I can soft reset for. However, I only have one Master Ball. Why would I need a second one? Well, I'll just say I'm playing the 3DS Virtual Console version of Crystal for a reason. Thanks to date skipping and doing every single in-game trade and getting borrowed Pokemon, like Kenya the Spearow and Shucky the Shuckle, as well as trading over all of my shinies from Red, Blue, Yellow, Gold, and Silver, including the in-game trades from Gen 1 that also have different trainer IDs, it didn't take that long for me to scum the Goldenrod Lottery to finally hit that five-digit match, getting myself an extra Master Ball. I could also do this infinitely for PowerPoint ups to max out my moves, but I wanted to go as fast as possible, and this process could have taken a lot longer than it did. With that said, it's back to four games and moving uber fast, and would you believe it, we managed to get it in around half an hour, getting a grand total of 1,075 encounters. Really damn good if I do say so myself. So I chuck my Master Ball at it, and we've got two beasts to add to the team. I haven't used Raikou yet, but I may as well have it in Suicune on standby in case the run turns into dog water and I need an emergency I win button, or two emergency I win buttons. Though considering the fact that this is Johto, I'm not sure I'm gonna need them. Anyway, one victory road later, including grabbing the TM for Earthquake so that Donphan can finally be great as opposed to... Kind of fine. It's finally time for the last mandatory rival fight. He's rocking a Sneasel lead as I go with, as expected, Gengar to Fire Punch this thing back into its Pokeball. Second is Golbat, Thunder Punch says goodbye. Third is Magneton, Fire Punch takes this one. Fourth is Haunter, Shadow Ball rips through as it does in the fifth with Kadabra, leaving just for Alligator to go down to Thunder Punch, soloing the team before the league. Now then, who to take into the league? Well, I'm bringing both beasts in, uh, so I opt to leave Wobbuffet in the box since it really is just a meme pick. May as well bring my six strongest in case, once again, things go to crap. But again, Gengar is insane, Donphan is cracked with Earthquake, Defense, Curl, Rollout, and Return, Typhlosion has Fire and Thunder Punch access so it makes a great backup to Gengar, and Dunsparce is... Well, not really needed at this point, but hey, it served me very well throughout the early and mid-game, and Stab Return still really hurts. But with that, let's tear through this league. First up is Will, so unsurprisingly, Gengar's out first, using Ice Punch to KO Zatu, Shadow Ball for Jinx, Ice Punch for Executor, Thunder Punch for Slowbro, which of course is a range, doesn't get it, and gets nailed with Psychic for half damage as a second KOs, leaving just the second Zatu to be taken out, just like the first with Ice Punch to win me the fight. Phew, uh, glad that range didn't result in an errant crit Psychic, that could have been disastrous. Second up is Koga, so I opt to use Typhlosion in the front for the fire typing. Oh wait, Gengar has Fire Punch. Down goes Ariados, Venomoth, and Fortress before Muck comes out, taking less than half from Fire Punch before reciprocating with a Minimize, but I know this thing's physical defense is much worse than its special, so Shadow Ball's able to connect through Minimize to KO, leaving just Crobat to fall to a single critical hit Ice Punch to rub salt in the wound, taking out his whole team without a single attack connecting on my side. Third up is Bruno, and while I don't have any Psychic type options, I do have Typhlosion with Stab Fire Blast, so I don't really care. It one-shots Hitmontop as Onyx is thrown out second, so predicting a Sandstorm, I swap into Dawnfan, and sure enough, I'm correct, leaving me free to use Earthquake to take the Rock Snake out. Third out is Hitmonchan, and since he's got the elemental punches, I opt to swap back into Typhlosion despite the Sandstorm, letting Hitmonchan get two turns of chip damage before firing off Fire Punch, not nearly KOing, but letting the third turn of Sandstorm chip take him down, leading to Machamp. 
From here, it's back in a Dawn fan to resist Rock Slide, then fire off Earthquake as Cross Chop only does a third, so I fire off two more Earthquakes to KO through a full restore, leaving just Hitmonlee to go down to a single Earthquake. Alright, easy part is over, now it's time for Karen. I don't have any fighting type moves, so I'm gonna have to just hit her really hard. And for me, usually that strategy works wonders. She leads Umbreon, so I go with Typhlosion to first get off a Fire Blast, which does around 70%, enough to not make her heal as a Sand Attack connects, forcing a dodge of Fire Punch for the next two turns as Faint Attack and Infuse Ray connect. So I say screw it and go out into Dunsparce to KO with Return, leading to Vileplume. Straight back into Typhlosion we go to KO it with Fire Punch, then both Gengar and Murkrow fall to one Fire Blast apiece, leaving just Houndoom. So it's just two returns from here, taking a crunch for a little over a third, and putting it down with a second to earn my second to last Johto victory. All that remains is Lance, and you better know Gengar is the perfect out of this fight, with exactly Ice and Thunder Punch. Thunder to Gyarados, Ice to Dragonite number one, Ice to Dragonite number two, Ice to Aerodactyl, without his Charizard, which nearly goes down to Thunder Punch, but it always... It's a range, and I didn't quite bridge the gap on, getting hit with a violent crit flamethrower for over half, but the second Thunder Punch does KO, leaving just the third Dragonite to go down to Ice Punch, finishing the fight without having to use either of the legendary beasts. Alright, well, on to Kanto, though before I take on those gym leaders, we have one more encounter to go. Heading back over to Goldenrod City, I made sure to trigger the GS Ball event, giving it to Kurt, then resetting the time to get it back and head into Ilex Forest for that last encounter in the only game I can get a hold of it, Celebi. So this hunt was... Frustrating to say the least. After booting up four copies of the game once again with the same save file and using the script once again, we noticed that the DVs weren't changing all that much and things weren't exactly... Random. Uh, turns out they were, but the DVs weren't reading correctly, leading the bot to accidentally reset over a shiny Celebi after 8,728 encounters just because the Lewis script didn't read the DVs correctly. However, since this was a script issue and not by my error, my chat was itching to see me finally capture this thing, so we went again, and only 3,676 encounters later, we managed to find another one. This was what the second Master Ball was for, and because of it being the virtual console version, it's the only legal way to shiny hunt your own Celebi. I knew I needed to do it here if I really wanted to get this thing into Pokemon Home, and I'm more than happy to finally have one of my own. Plus, as a kid who played through the explorers of games for the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon game, specifically Darkness and Sky, it's nice to finally have a shiny Celebi that I can use in the main games. So I replaced Dunsparce on the team to fill out my Grassfire Water Core that I like to have very, very much. Though two of them being legendaries and one a starter honestly feels really weird. I'm still very much not used to using legendaries all that much in my runs. But with our final shiny hunt in the books, it's time to ram our way through Kanto. Lieutenant Surge is up first, getting one shot and destroyed by five Dawn Fan Earthquakes, bypassing both Electrode's attempts at double team for our first badge. Second up is Erica, getting burned through with Typhlosion thanks to Fire Punch on Tangela, then Fire Blast connecting on both Blossom and Victory Bell, only missing once against Jumpluff before she set up Leech Seed, but thanks to not missing on the second time around, no damage was done to me for yet another perfect fight. Third up is Sabrina, housing an Espeon lead as I went with Gengar, and thanks to keeping around Shadow Ball, it's more than enough to pound Espeon, Mr. Mime, and Alakazam into the ground with one shot each for the third perfect Kanto gym battle. Fourth in my lineup is Misty, in which I gave Gengar the TM for Giga Drain over Hidden Power. Since there's no more Kingdras to deal with in this run, why would I have both a Dragon and an Ice-type move on the set? This gives me a perfect out to Quagsire for this fight, though, as Thunder Punch takes care of Golduck, Giga Drain on Quagsire, then two Thunder Punches on Lapras, missing Blizzard in the process, and a single Thunder Punch on Starmie for the fourth flawless victory. Now with the expansion card, I can wake up those Snorlaxes... Uh, except I forgot to grab both the radio card and the bicycle back in Goldenrod, so I had to head back there first. But I was planning on going back there anyway, as in Crystal version, Bill's dad hangs outside of the game corner on Wednesdays, so I'm able to pay him to give Typhlosion Flamethrower over Fire Punch, Gengar Thunderbolt over Thunder Punch for some more added power, and if these two weren't deadly before, then they certainly are the perfect duo now. Raikou also got Thunderbolt and Suicune Ice Beam just in case, but again, I don't anticipate on having to use these unless I need an oh shit button. Back to Kanto Gyms, Brock is fifth with Gengar, taking out all five of his Pokemon with the five power points of Giga Drain, tearing through Graveler, Rhyhorn, Amistar, Onix, and Kabutops in sequence to earn the Boulder Badge. Sixth is Janine, falling to Dawn Fan with Return on Crobat, then Earthquake on Oridos, Venomoth, Weezing, and Weezing number two for our sixth flawless win. Blaine goes the same with Earthquake, taking out Magmar, Magcargo, and... 
Ah, well, I can't expect to outspeed Rapidash, cutting Nail with a Fire Blast that manages to burn, but Don Fan's physical attack is so far beyond at this point that even while halved, still manages to one-shot with super effective Stab Earthquake to win. I mean, jeez, I knew Stat Experience was powerful. I guess I can't knock 100 Power Stab Earthquake along with a base 120 physical attack on Don Fan. Still sad I didn't quite do the Kanto Gym Leader's damage list completely, though. However, it was all gonna fall apart with Blue anyway, considering his type diverse team. Once at level 58, though, I'm ready to go as he leads Pidgeot against my Gengar, using Thunderbolt to one-shot as Rhydon enters second and falls to Giga Drain. Alakazam's third and goes down to Shadow Ball, fourth out is Gyarados going down to Thunderbolt, and Arcanine to two Thunderbolts following a Flamethrower when it comes out fifth, and Executor to Ice Punch to win the fight. So I guess it didn't matter all that much in regards to type diversity. This makes me wish Gengar got access to, like, Surf. Although that just comes with a very funny visual of the player character trying to hop on Gengar's back, only to completely phase through and land in the water, cursing himself for soaking literally everything. Now wouldn't that be a fun Pokemon animated short, displaying why Pokemon only learn certain types of moves? Funny diatribe aside, one flashless Mount Silver later, and I'm ready. Level 75, it's time for Red. First up is Pikachu, so Dawn Fan takes center stage to Earthquake Pikachu following a charm, still managing to one-shot with halved attack for the second time this run. Not bad. Venusaur's in second, so it's out to Typhlosion, missing two Fire Blasts in a row as Solar Beam connects twice for around a third. So I say screw it, Flamethrower's boosted by Sunny Day, and it should still KO, and sure enough it did. Guess I did a little bit of a whoopsie there. Third out is Espeon, oddly enough. Was really expecting Blastoise, but I guess it doesn't make sense in the sun, so I just swap in a Dawn Fan on a Reflect to fire back with an Earthquake for over half, protecting next turn to get Leftovers Recovery before finishing it off next turn. Usually I forget about this item being available in the trash can in Celadon City in the building where you get the coin case from Gen 1, but this time I didn't, and I'm happy I replaced Defense Girl with Protect just for this instance. Fourth out is Blastoise finally, so it's out to Gengar to soak up this massive HP stat following a critical surf on switch in. Initially I was just gonna go for Thunderbolt, but after seeing that Giga Drain was a two shot, I said hey, why not? Let's get some free HP here. Fifth out is Snorlax and oh, wowie, after a bunch of amnesias, none of Gengar's attacks are doing jack shit. So it's out to Don Fan to work that physical defense and recover with leftovers, though Body Slam does eventually paralyze after a few times, making it harder to eventually KO, but with two earthquakes eventually sealing the deal before any more uses of rest are able to spoil my fun, it brings in Charizard as his last Pokemon. I've got plenty enough HP to try getting a return out here though, so I do so for over half damage as Flamethrower takes half of Dawn Fan's remaining HP. So to not risk a crit and go deathless in the last game of Gen 2, it's out to Typhlosion. Starter versus starter, who will come out on top? Oh, who am I kidding? I have Thunder Punch for super effective damage. Bye bye Charizard, you're just a worse Typhlosion for having that flying typing. And with that, Pokemon Crystal with only shinies is complete. I'm willing to bet I must have caught some of you who went down in the comments preemptively to say LEGENDARY SHOULD BE BANNED! Heck, I literally handicapped myself to only three team members throughout the entirety of Kanto by having Raikou, Suicune, and Celebi in my party, and just not using them. Honestly, it's all just an excuse to build out a shiny living dex in Pokemon Home, and I had to go after these eventually. When using every not-cheating device at your disposal for these games, it's much easier to do so when it takes much less power to run through emulation than a GameCube with Colosseum, or attempting the nightmare that is Fire Red and Leaf Green RNG manipulation for the roaming ones. Not to mention that Static Suicune really helped speed things up along with the Pokemon Center New York Raikou. Overall, I'm pretty happy finishing out Gen 2 with a deathless game, and I'm really looking forward to jumping into Gen 3. I did that whole Ruby and Sapphire Shiny Professor Oaks challenge last month in preparation for this exactly, so that I would have enough practice with RNG Manips so that those games would be much faster stream-wise. So I hope you look forward to the video that comes from those. I'm gonna be going back to combining games for this series, by the way, since we're in the era of RNG manipulation for now in Gens 3 through 5, so it shouldn't take nearly as long for videos to come out, though still expect Fire and Leaf Green to take an eternity, since I'm probably just gonna have to raw dog those games. I've literally practiced the manipulations for them, and the seeding is just absolutely ridiculous. It feels like whoever programmed the games to work like that was a literal chimpanzee. I mean, it could not have been a human with how spaghetti coated it is, but we will get to that in due time. Hey folks, Ncard Meatball here, thanks for checking out the video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe and like, plus check out this other video on screen, you'll probably enjoy it too. And if you really enjoyed the content and want to help me produce more content like this, make sure to become a channel member, leave a super thanks in the comments below, or grab some gamer subs using my affiliate link in the description using code chaoticmeat at checkout for 10% off. 
And heck, maybe we might get our own cup and flavor for the community in the future if we end up moving enough stuff. Every little bit helps, and it keeps the lights on. Also, I want to give you guys a reminder that the Shiny Franchise Nuzlocke is still being streamed. I did take a little bit of a break to play some other games to help prevent with burnout, but now that I'm catching up on the videos for this series, I'm going to have to get more help with that timer. So come on by, enjoy yourselves, contribute to the timer if you can. But I have a lot of fun interacting with you guys live, so it would be cool to see more of you folks pop in. But with that, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you tomorrow for another stream of the Shiny Franchise Nuzlocke.